time on introduction, but it's my great pleasure to have Lucy Suchman up today in the first slot. Uh, Lucy's work in Xerox Park is well known to you. If you didn't already know it, it's in the papers that she's given to us. She's also been really inspiring for an entire generation of feminist SDS scholars, including myself and Lily and several people that we know. Um, so uh, without further ado, Lucy Suchman. Okay, Thanks, and I, I wanted to start by just um, thanking James and uh, thinking about the, the word care that came up yesterday. Um, often I'm, when I'm giving talks, I'm talking about relations of, of humans and technologies and their entanglements, and, and I'm always struck by the fact that I, I live that in the preparation for giving the talk. There's, there's a James person, not always as wonderful as James, but you know, a person like that who's going around getting you incorporated into the, 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 the system, attending to the needs of all of the machines. You know, are their batteries okay? Are they plugged in in the places they need to? And, and I always find that there's something very wonderful about that. So I just wanted to start by, by acknowledging that. Um, my contribution uh, is inspired by um, this book, The End of Capitalism uh, as We Knew It, uh, which has become a kind of um, model uh, for me. Uh, I guess in a way my project, as I'm suggesting, has become the end of innovation uh, as we knew it. Um, and in this book, uh, the uh, feminist uh, economists Catherine Gibson and Julie Graham, who interestingly have merged their identity into a singular author called J.K. Gibson Graham. Um, they remind us of the particular performative effects of words with initial capitals, capitals, so capitalism in their case. They're concerned with the ways in which those who are engaged critically with capitalist political economic forms might themselves be caught in enacting a singularized capitalism as the figure for all forms of contemporary economic activity, and how that could work to hold in place precisely the relations that we might want to displace. It's in the disjuncture between the singularity of figures and their enacted multiplicities, they suggest, that the interesting possibilities lie. This argument isn't uniquely theirs, of course, but I think they articulate it particularly uh, eloquently. So not surprisingly, what I'm suggesting is that the same could hold uh, for those of us who want to be engaged in a critical and also generative way with the figure of innovation. In extricating ourselves uh, from what strike me as the extraordinarily repetitive terms that have been available to us for imagining practices and processes of transformative change. Uh, and my aim in the first paper that uh, I posted for the seminar is to weave relocations in the discipline of anthropology since the 1960s together with the rise of professional design. So when I say design, I'm usually referring to professional design as, as, as it's been professionalized. So professional design as a dominant figure of transformative change. And I recall in the paper how anthropology's growing awareness in the latter part of the 20th century of its own colonial history and associated calls for its reinvention led, among other shifts, to a turn towards home, understood as the value, even the urgency, of anthropological inquiry into locations characterized by their cultural familiarity and their political and economic centrality. For me, this turn unfolded uh, as a long-term immersion within a site identified as a center of innovation and future making, which became my own professional home. In the paper, uh, I outlined a series of moments um, offered as kind of illustrative cases to describe uh, an engagement between anthropology and design based in anthropological reframings of received conceptualizations of the design problem. So that was the kind of methodological strategy. In each case, these reframings shifted attention to that which overflows the frame, arguing that those things that exceeded the bounds of design comprise the conditions of possibility for its efficacy. OK, uh, so I've organized my presentation in modules, in, in four parts, four, four small parts. Um, there are four interrelated problematics um, that I hope will seed our discussion. Um, I'm going to stop in between each one and, and see if they've inspired or provoked some kind of um, thoughts, comments, et cetera, you know, if, if when I do that, it hasn't happened yet, 
I'll just go on. <laughs> um, and I'm going to start with the, with the future, um, and more specifically um, with this passage from the introductory text for our seminar. Um, and the question here, uh, which I think is posed for me, is what does it mean to take seriously the heterotemporality of past, present, and future? particularly with respect to technoscience, and more particularly with respect to imaginaries and material practices of future making. And I'm not going to answer that question, um, but I take it as part of our collective project. What does it mean to take this seriously? Um, so I'm going to start uh, with a kind of exhibit. It's the one that opens the paper that I circulated, and I'm just going to read that opening passage. The future arrives sooner here. Driving my car down Hillview Avenue in Palo Alto, California one evening around 1995, I hear this assertion on U.S. national public radio, spoken by a Silicon Valley technologist who's being interviewed, someone who obviously has been identified as such. It elicits a by now familiar response, a bodily resistance to being hailed into this claim to the vanguard, with its attendant mandate to enact the future that others will subsequently live. These words constitute a place, a here, that comprises part of my research object. They position the speaker in an identifiable territory, indexically referencing the interviewee's location as the Silicon Valley, and in turn, of course, performing the existence of that place once again through this naming of it. And in their positing of a singular universal future, these words reiterate as well a familiar past in the form of a diffusionist model of change. Described by Johannes Fabian in Time and the Other as a form of temporal distancing, this involves, quote, placing chronologically contemporary and spatially distant peoples along a temporal trajectory such that the record of humanity across the globe is progressively ordered in historical time. Again, very familiar move. The kind of temporal distancing enacted in a statement such as this is also, in this sense, a colonizing move. Uh, and I, I just wanted to note uh, that this map um, I found on the website, interestingly, of the Asia Pacific Student Entrepreneurial Society. <laughs> what could be more appropriate from their, from their summit in 2002? Uh, you know, there are variations of this map um, out on the web. And I also have juxtaposed the map from Kavita's uh, paper, um, Postcolonial Technopolitics, which is, you know, again, another repetition. Um, of a similar imaginary. So we can read this statement, the future arrives sooner here, as reproducing the neocolonial geographies of center and periphery and temporalities of technological development that in the mid-1990s underwrote the Silicon Valley's figuration as central to the future of everywhere. Arturo Escobar proposes the term technoscape to reference the ways in which discourses and practices generated by and around information and communications technologies comprise a kind of landscape to be inhabited. Like other maps, depictions of the technoscape are not simply aids to navigation through an already existing terrain, but propositions for a geography within which relevant subjects and objects might claim their place. Elaborating the trope of the scape, a Potteri ori orients this as well to what he names techniques for the production of locality emphasizing that the local is not the ground for cultural analysis, but the figure, not already given, but constituted in and through practices such as the statement with which I began, the future arrives sooner here. So this here is, in the, the here in this pronouncement is the unmarked area that I want to mark and bring into a more symmetrical analysis uh, in uh, in a more symmetrical kind of analytic relation um, to its others. Um, so. I will stop for a moment just to see if, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to part two. So if we could agree that post-colonial forms of future making require geographies that have less certain centers, one contribution might be an anthropology of those places presently enacted as centers of innovation that illuminates the provincial contingencies and uncertainties of their own futures as well as the situated practices required to sustain their reproduction as central. And so that brings me um, to uh, my, my second part. My thinking about these questions um, draws from an archive of memories um, and documentary materials assembled during my 20-year tenure, that was from 1979 to 1999, at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center. <laughs> 
otherwise known as PARC. At its founding in 1970, PARC represented an investment in making technology futures. Deliberately placed far from Xerox's corporate headquarters in Connecticut, the founding story goes, oft repeated, the research center was located on the west coast of the United States in the nascent, nascent Silicon Valley and charged with making difference. In a topography mirroring earlier waves of westward expansion, Park is positioned within this imaginary as a kind of advanced settlement <coughs> on the frontier of emerging new markets in computing. But frontiers, Anna Singh reminds us, are, quote, not just discovered at the edge, they are projects in making geographic and temporal experience, end of her quote. As we know, such projects involve disengaging landscapes from already existing forms of life so that they can be figured as an emptiness waiting to be filled. Like its predecessors, the frontiers of computing are imagined to be indefinitely extensible, even more reflexively an effect of the activities of those who gain ben benefit from them than frontiers marked more obviously by landscapes and natural resources. And as Singh observes, quote, the activity of the frontier is to make human subjects as well as natural objects. It is a space of desire. It calls. It appears to create its own demands. Once it is glimpsed, what one cannot but explore and exploit it further. Words which resonate um, directly uh, with my own experience. The decade of Park's founding coincided as well with a particular moment in American anthropology's relocation as a field. The turn to studying up set out most famously by Laura Nader in her contribution to the edited volume, Reinventing Anthropology, itself a wonderful title for, for my purposes. Committed to this call as a student of anthropology, my broad aim was to engage with power, which I always thought of in scare quotes, performatively through an ethnography of the everyday life of a major American corporation. Searching for a site in which to pursue this project led me through a series of serendipitous circumstances to Xerox, and more specifically to Xerox Park. And I give a more extended account of the history of anthropological engagement um, at Park in uh, the second of the papers um, that I posted. And just a, a, a little erratum here, I sent a new version of that paper um, to, to James and, and uh, Jennifer because in rereading both papers, I discovered a little bit of self-plagiarism in the second paper, because <laughs> I've been working on them in parallel, so I've, I've corrected that. So none of the, you would probably notice it, but it really bothered me, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, so I, I landed at Xerox Park, and, and I became drawn on my arrival at Park into questions of technology. So in, I, I offer some examples of my engagements in the two papers um, that I've posted, but to make a long story short, uh, over the ensuing 20 years, I and my colleagues at PARC worked to enact various forms of generative interference, um, partly critical interventions, but also small-scale, longer-term, where both of those are crucial, that they were small-scale, long-term, that itself was, was an interference, um, small-scale, long-term projects involving co-development of prototype systems for making, storing, and using both paper and digital documents, because we were at Xerox, crafted in close engagement with the working practices of those who were among the technology's prospective users. Each project that we did was shaped by what was learned and what was absent from the previous one. So the question uh, was always, given what we know now, what should we do next? Given where we are, how can we proceed in a responsible way? Although this strategy uh, and the extended history of collaborative experimentation and engagement through which it was realized uh, was unquestionably fruitful, it also raises a number of questions uh, for me. And to address those questions requires bringing into view the politics of design, including the systematic placement of politics beyond the limits of the designer's frame. And that's uh, where I want to go in my third part. But I'll just pause again to see if any questions or thoughts. Okay, I can, I can see now we're on a roll and you just want me to <laughs> roll on through and then at the end we'll, okay, good. Um, okay. Okay. So Andrew Barry uh, has proposed that one of the marks, so I, I now want to shift to this question of design. Andrew Barry has proposed that one of the marks of a technological society is an orientation that privileges change and then figures change as technological innovation. Innovation, in turn, is embedded within a broader cultural imaginary 
that posits a world that is always lagging, always in need of being brought up to date through the intercessions of those trained to shape it, a world in some in need of design. A particularly encompassing expression of this orientation uh, is the project titled Massive Change, the Future of Global Design, launched around 2005 by Canadian designer and architect Bruce Mao and the Institute Without Boundaries, which is actually a small team that operates out of Mao's studio in Toronto. Massive Change, but this was an exhibit that, that traveled. Massive Change, the website proclaims, is not about the world of design. It's about the design of the world. And the text continues. Design has emerged as one of the world's most powerful forces. It has placed us at the beginning of a new, unprecedented period of human possibility where all economies and ecologies are becoming global, relational, and interconnected. Design has emerged as a force of nature, this declaration implies, and it now places us at the beginning of something new, unprecedented, and global. This announced tipping point of past and future action is a hallmark of new things. Capacity, which is represented here by a supercomputer that's made more super by this kind of fisheye lens, uh, promises that we can now, and every time I read the word we, uh, it has little scare quotes, uh, we can now, quote, plan and produce desired outcomes through design at an unprecedented scale. This leads, seem seemingly inexorably via this orange arrow, to the global scale, a cycle of movement of things that, while seemingly circular, presumably head somewhere that we want to go. This is confirmed by the resulting optimism that we can or will, for the first time in history, quote, minimize unintended consequences and maximize positive outcomes, delivering innovations like the hippo roller, a polyethylene drum uh, designed by South African designers uh, Petty Penzer and Johan Jonker to enable the transport of 20 gallons of water over rough terrain with minimal strain on the body. And as far as I can tell, that is not itself a project of the Massive Change Initiative. It's a, it was funded in, and distributed through the World Food Program and other NGOs, um, but it's the, the emblematic um, case for optimism. The position of design is further illustrated by this model in which design moves from being one among the four primary elements of nature, culture, business, and design, albeit at the core, to being the enveloping, encompassing, and by implication directing force, leading to a variation on the 19th century declaration of the conquest of nature, quote, nature itself has fallen to the regime of design, and the rhetorical query regarding the future, now that we can do anything, what will we do? I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Tracing the genealogy of the proposition that we can do anything might take us back again to the 1970s, a particular decade in the history of professional design in the United States. The first call for a science of design is commonly attributed to Herbert Simon's manifesto, The Sciences of the Artificial. Based on a series of lectures delivered, and we can assume to an audience made up largely of scientists and engineers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1969. Trained as a political scientist, Simon received the Turing Award, that's the highest award in computing, in 1975 for his contributions to artificial intelligence and the psychology of human cognition. And three years later, he received a Nobel Prize in economics for, quote, his pioneering research into the decision-making process within economic organizations. So Simon's design palette encompassed the multiple sites targeted for a science and technology of enhanced rationality in the mid-20th century, from brains to boardrooms. For Simon, the road to scientific legitimacy was paved with a requisite reduction in so-called intuitive judgment in favor of demonstrable rationalities, a move from, in his words, quote, soft, cookbooky knowledge to a body of tough, analytic, teachable doctrine. And that's from the Sciences of the Artificial. In his collection of responsive essays titled The Politics of the Artificial, Victor Margolin argues that one result of Simon's paternity is a lineage focused, quote, more on creating models of the design process than on developing a critical theory of practice. Margolin observes that Simon's rhetoric naturalized design methods and embedded them in a technical framework that privileged systems thinking as a means of generating design projects and efficiency as a way of judging the effectiveness of design thought. In calling for a more open conception of design activity, 
Margolin urges a positioning of history, theory, and criticism as central rather than peripheral elements, including critical examination of conceptions of design theory inherited from Simon and his followers. In thinking of design as a social practice, Margolin argues, we're always obliged to consider and evaluate the conditions in which it occurs. He concludes that, quote, if designers are going to realize the full potential of design thought, then they should also learn to analyze how the situations that frame design practice are themselves constructed. Amen. The, this resonates uh, as well with what Phil Agri names a critical technical practice, uh, which he describes this way, which will be re familiar to many of you. Instead of seeking foundations, it would embrace the impossibility of foundations, guiding itself by a continually unfolding awareness of its own workies, workings as a historically specific practice. It would make further inquiry into the practice an integral part of the practice itself. It would accept that this reflexive inquiry places all of its concepts and methods at risk, and it would regard this risk positively, not as a threat to rationality, but as the promise of better ways of doing things. It's hard for me to think of a better articulation, of <laughs> a hopeful articulation of, of what design uh, might be. So let me close um, then uh, by looping back um, to the question of innovation uh, that I started with. Um, in the paper, um, I report a moment uh, which I find really interesting. When Park itself was remade as a site of um, what in our seminar overview is called lack and belatedness, um, that, that is precisely the condition so familiar uh, in the rhetorics of development um, within which Park had stood as the vanguard. And I do a kind of reading of this fantastic um, roundtable from the Harvard Business Review among four CEOs, which when I read it recently, um, retrospectively made enormous sense out of what I experienced um, at, in this period in the mid-90s. Um, uh, but then I, I basically try to understand um, this particular form of, of re reflexivity as part called for its own reinvention in the mid 1990s Silicon Valley, and to read it through the lived experience of the, and of, of the subject position in which it placed um, me and my colleagues at the time. Uh, and my exhibit here is this email. Um, sent out to all of Park in the midst of this exercise, which I describe uh, in more length in the paper. Um, so uh, th this um, email reads, the notion of Park 2000, as the exercise was named, is not intended to suggest that we're developing a plan targeted for, for the year 2000. What it does imply is the need to do three things. One, to comprehend now what the future is becoming. Two, to achieve a platform for continually understanding how we can impact the world by what we choose to do at PARC. And three, to launch a near-term strategy for if and how we should be different. Senior staff are convinced that everyone, no matter what job function you fill, can play an active role in helping us shape the future. So the future no longer simply arrives sooner here, but rather has a kind of independent agency positioned beyond the confines or control of the research laboratory or even the wider Silicon Valley. And rather than being invented and propagated, this future now requires an understanding of a future that is becoming elsewhere as well as here. Park's researchers are called upon not only to shape a future for others, but for themselves, not in the sense of build what you use and use what you build, which was the, the maxim that informed um, the early days of invention at Park, but in the sense of inventing a future in which they themselves will have a place. This call prompted more questions than answers. Why this exercise? Why now? These questions contributed to, became, to what became a period of intensive and competing rounds of storytelling. Stories that variously narrated a past that could make sense of the present, what Park was and had be, what it had been and what it had become, and presence in the form of existing and imagined projects that might answer the call to future making what Park could be. Many of the stories told had to those involved in telling and hearing them little discernible effect. But their generation involved a familiar competitive kind of micropolitics of self-positioning and participation was mandatory. Failure to participate risked disappearing from the picture, having no place in the future under construction. The exercise enrolled us in, in some in taking the organization as an object of design and remaking ourselves collectively into something new, 
This required not only imagining possible organizational futures, but also establishing a past and present park against which difference could be measured. Reflecting a familiar pattern in histories of the future, the past that was created was a nostalgic one to which in some respects the reinvention aimed to return. How, we were asked, might we recapture the intellectual excitement that had been lost? These statements forgot the vagaries and uncertainties that my own archives from those earlier times clearly documented. The present, commensurately, was framed as a lack or emptiness to which reinvention was a necessary and urgent response. The very fact that a project was already underway could be grounds for its identification as a legacy, something left over from the past that gets in the way of progress towards a new future. This worked in turn to silence those of us who felt that in part in response to previous calls for innovation, we were deep in the midst of carrying through on commitments already made. Rather than responsible action, our reluctance to abandon existing projects and join in the project of renewal was read as a kind of recalcitrance a form of resistance to change. Postcolonial scholarship within anthropology, science and technology studies and related fields makes clear that far from a universal good, the valorization of newness is a local preoccupation. Identifying actors invested in particular forms of property within specific regimes of commodity capitalism, and I recommended Kavita's wonderful paper about piracy in this regard. The new on this understanding is an outcome rather than a starting point of assessment. The similarity that enables the making of difference is not inherent in things, but an achievement of relevant discursive and material practices. The papers that I've posted were written in part in the context of a just concluded project named Relocating Innovation, Places and Material Practices of Future Making, which was inspired by the question of how to think about futures and future making differently. My own piece of that project began with the question, what could it mean to take park as a particular place without presupposing it as a unique or exceptional one? What if rather than taking such a site as central, we treat it instead as one site among others, and even in itself not as one, but as many? A key move is to shift from a view of the research center as the origin of change to an understanding of the center as involved in the circulation of technological imaginaries, artifacts, and regimes of value. Combined with an appreciation for the ways in which circulating objects are refracted in distinctive and even unique ways through particular places and persons and things, this shift provides a basis for a kind of decentering of innovation. Homi Bhabha directs our attention to the indeterminate spatiality and temporality of the in-between as crucial to a post-colonial figuration of difference, an in insight that I take to be generative for thinking about objects as well as subjects and about relations in old, of old and new that are so central to discourses of design. The latter systematically obscure the in-between to assert discontinuity. But if we treat change not in terms of fixed boundaries or breaks, but rather as ongoing engagements through which each term defines itself in relation to its other, then newness is less a property than it is an articulation that calls out differences from whatever is referenced as the thing that came before. The premium placed on discrete, discontinuous change events and the generally negative value attributed to processes of incremental change are, on this understanding, part of a form of wishful thinking that aims to bring about desired transformations without the associated costs in time and human effort. I close with the question of how a critical anthropology of design might contribute to the emergence of a critical technical practice of the kind that Phil Agri articulated. The conditions of possibility for both, I believe, include recognition of the specificity, location, and generative limits of method, such that a responsible practice is one characterized by humility rather than by hubris, aspiring not to massive change or discontinuous innovation, but to modest interventions within ongoing, continually shifting and unfolding landscapes of transformation. Thanks.